What if I told you it was possible to get a wide range of molecules to emit laser light in the visible portion of the spectrum if you shake them hard enough? In this episode, let's take a look at a remarkably simple device, the Raman laser. A topic like Raman lasers requires a little bit of an introduction to some fundamentals, so let's start off with light scattering. Light scattering refers to physical processes involving the interaction of light with matter. This can occur on the macro, micro and nanoscopic scales. You've probably never even really given light scattering a second thought other than to appreciate, albeit briefly, that you wouldn't see anything at all without it, since classically light is scattered from the rough surfaces of objects. Light though can also be scattered off molecules in isolation, for example in transparent gases, liquids and solids. There are several mechanisms responsible for scattering and some can have very pronounced effects, especially if light travels through the material. Rayleigh scattering, for example, is an elastic scattering process where light is scattered off in all directions off of air molecules. No energy is lost and therefore the scattered light has the same energy as the incoming light. The amount of Rayleigh scattering is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength and what that means in real terms is that blue light is scattered much more than red light as it propagates through the atmosphere. This is what results in the sky appearing blue. Raman scattering is named after the Indian scientist C. V. Raman, who discovered it in 1928 with the assistance of his student K. S. Krishnan. Raman was awarded the 1930 Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of Raman scattering. Raman scattering is an inelastic process, which is to say that the incoming light causes the molecular bonds to vibrate, for example by stretching, bending, twisting and rotating. If we direct a laser beam at a molecule, Raman scattering results in the scattered light having a different, usually lower energy than the incoming light, and this is called a Stokes shift. In very special circumstances, shorter wavelengths or anti-Stokes light can be generated. Only a very small fraction of incoming photons, about 1 in 10 million, undergo Raman scattering. The wavelength shift for Raman scattering is dependent on the bond types present in the molecule, and so these effects are exploited in Raman spectroscopy to analyse molecules in a sample. There is an excellent site describing Raman spectroscopy here that I'll link in down below, with labelled graphs showing the bonds that actually cause the Raman scattering. Stimulated Raman scattering is a third order nonlinear optical effect that occurs when an excess of Stokes photons that are generated by normal Raman scattering are present in addition to the excitation beam. In this case, the total Raman scattering rate is increased way beyond that of spontaneous Raman scattering. Pump photons are converted more rapidly into additional Stokes photons. The more Stokes photons that are already present, the faster more of them are added. Effectively, this amplifies the Stokes light in the presence of the pump light. And this is used in Raman amplifiers and Raman lasers. Stimulated Raman scattering is also one of the mechanisms exploited in supercontinuum lasers. There is a really nice in-depth explanation of stimulated Raman scattering by the YouTube channel Your Favourite TA. I'll link that in down below. The Raman laser was discovered in 1962 by Gisela Eckhart and E.J. Woodbury. The discovery itself was actually unintentional. A ruby laser was being operated with an intracavity cur cell and an unexpected wavelength was observed during measurement. This was investigated and found to be stimulated Raman scattering from the nitrobenzene in the cur cell. Further investigation led to the development of the Raman laser or Raman shifter. Raman lasers are optically pumped by other lasers. However, this pumping does not produce population inversion as in regular lasers. Instead, pump photons are absorbed and re-emitted as lower frequency light photons by stimulated Raman scattering. The difference between the two photon energies is fixed and corresponds to the vibrational frequency of the gain medium. This makes it possible, in principle, to produce any laser output wavelengths that you want by choosing the pump laser wavelength and the gain media appropriately. This is in contrast to conventional lasers where the possible laser output wavelengths are determined solely by the emission lines of the gain material. Raman materials, lasers or shifters are available commercially with a wide range of wavelengths advertised. These generally contain crystals of barium nitrate or potassium gadolinium tungstate as the Raman gain medium. However, the crystals of these must be grown really quite large, about 60 to 80 millimeters in length and are very expensive. Since stimulated Raman scattering can take place in a wide variety of solids, liquids and gases, in the lab, Raman lasers can be constructed from high-pressure gas cells such as the one shown in this really nice article here. 
I love how in this article this is described as simple. All you need is a high pressure gas cell a meter or so long filled with hundreds of pounds per square inch of deuterium. Fundamentally though, a Raman laser is nothing more than a windowed cell containing a suitable Raman gain medium and there are gain mediums available that are less expensive or difficult to handle than large crystals or deuterium. Here is a diagram of the overall setup for a very simple Raman laser. I suppose technically this is a shifter since it lacks resonator mirrors, but the overall result will be frequency shifted narrowband laser light. On the left, we have a high peak power Q-switch YAG laser, the beam of which will pass through a KTP crystal, doubling it to 532 nanometers green. This is then focused by a lens through a window into the Raman cell and the output beam is collimated by a second lens. When the laser fires, intense laser light is focused into the cell causing stimulated Raman scattering, emitting Raman shifted coherent light. Note that in this diagram the light isn't focused into an infinite point, but is instead, as is the real way of things, focused into a waste. A long interaction length along with high peak powers is required for Raman lasers. A lens with a longer focal length will result in a longer interaction length than a shorter focal length lens. As for the gain medium, there are several candidate materials listed in this table. We can see that deuterium is in there with a gain of 1.1, but there is also acetone with close to unity gain, ethanol with a gain of 4, carbon disulfide with a huge gain, nitrogen, benzene and even water is listed, although the gain for that is really quite low. I came across this paper which suggests that stimulated Raman scattering can be observed in a relatively short cell, just 10 centimeters in length. I attempted to experiment with acetone and ethanol in a 10 cm long curvette pumped by a frequency double tattoo laser that I rebuilt in a previous episode. However, I didn't see any stimulated Raman scattering in acetone or ethanol. I thought I'd try some other liquids such as the anethol I'd used in the Curcell episode, and eventually I tried dimethyl sulfoxide in the cell. Briefly, a brilliant orange-red coherent laser beam emerged. I wish I'd actually been filming this at the time as the cell promptly ate itself. Plain glass does not fare well at these huge peak power levels, but I figured that a purpose-built cell with quartz windows would fare much better. I decided to machine a cell from hex aluminium bar stock. I bored out the center, added recesses for O-ring seals, added a filling barb, and made end pieces to hold the windows in place. The windows are quartz, anti-reflection coated from AliExpress, and at just a dollar a piece are almost disposable. The cell was then filled with dimethyl sulfoxide. And here is the end result. Let's get this thing on the optical bench and see if we can get some Raman laser light out of it. I'll walk you through all of the parts of this Raman laser setup. Obviously, before I begin, it would be remiss of me not to mention safety. Uh, obviously, don't try anything that you see on this channel at home if you don't know what you're doing. And if you do attempt to try anything like this at home, invest in a proper certified pair of laser safety eyewear. In order to pump the Raman laser, I need a suitably high-powered laser source. And I have on the bench here a laser I refurbished previously on this channel. This actually started life as a tattoo removal laser head. Um, this produces about 120 millijoules of infrared light at 1064 nanometers in just 20 nanoseconds. And this equates to a peak power of about 1.2 megawatts. The light from this is passed through a frequency doubling crystal. This is potassium titanyl phosphate, and this will double the infrared light into 532 nanometers green light that I can use to pump my Raman laser. The power supply in the background has also been featured previously on this channel and has had a couple of upgrades since it was last seen. I have my Raman laser experiment set up on the bench now. The layout of this approximates that shown in the diagram previously, so it should be fairly easy to follow. In the center here, I have my homemade Raman cell, and then to the rear of it, I have an objective lens that's going to focus the 532 nanometer pump light in through the end window into a point into the middle of the cell. On the output side of the cell, I have a collimating lens to collimate the beam. And then in front of that, I have a dichroic beam splitter. The dichroic beam splitter will pass green light straight through to a dump on the far end of the bench and hopefully reflect any red laser light that's emitted at 90 degrees to that out towards where the camera is. In front of the output, I have a long pass filter. This is just to catch any green that might have been reflected from the dichroic beam splitter. Um, the camera will see the green far more easily than it will see red light, and I don't want to wash it out when we try and film this. Because I'm filming a very bright and very short duration laser pulse, I've had to stop down the camera as far as it will go so the scene looks quite dark. 
And additionally, I've also had to slow down the frame rate to guarantee that we catch any short pulses on camera. Anyway, let's fire this thing up. Absolutely fantastic. I'll show you that shot again. Out of the front of the filter there, we can see a brilliant orange-red beam emerge. Absolutely fantastic. This is working way better than I'd hoped for. Because the output from pulsed lasers is so brief, I thought I'd take a long exposure photograph of the setup, and this has turned out absolutely beautiful. On the right hand side we can see the brilliant green pump beam entering the Raman cell, on the left we can see the dump beams, and then in the middle we've got this absolutely gorgeous orange-red Raman laser light coming out. Absolutely spectacular. I have the Raspberry Pi spectrometer set up on the bench now so we can take a measurement of the actual wavelength emitted by the Raman laser. The Raman laser beam is being terminated by a graphite beam stop and the light reflected from it will be picked up by the spectrometer. If we take a look at the output from the Raspberry Pi spectrometer, we can see a peak at 532 nanometers, which is the pump wavelength, and the very narrow Raman shifted output at 629 nanometers. This is a shift of around 97 nanometers, and if we run this through a Raman shift calculator, we can see that the shift is 2,898 odd wave numbers. If we take a look at the Raman spectrum for dimethyl sulfoxide, we can see a shift of about 2,875 wave numbers, which should give approximately 628 nanometers or a 96 nanometer shift. This is more or less spot on. Absolutely fantastic. This has worked out really very well indeed with clearly observable Raman lasing. I think I've been a little ambitious here with such a small 10 cm long cell, so for future work I'd probably make the cell twice as long to increase the interaction length, invest in some proper optics, and set up a circulation system for the liquid to prevent thermal lensing. There is a lot more exploration work to be done here in terms of different Raman media and some interesting work I've been looking at recently on hollow coil liquid filled fibres. As always, a huge thank you to my awesome Patreons, channel donators and subscribers. Your support is what makes science and engineering videos like this possible. 